Neil and Dad and me. What a beautiful noise coming out from the street. Got a beautiful sound. Got a beautiful beat. The stereo arrived one Christmas in the early 70s, a boxy brown colossus in three parts. It was almost as high as me and sprawled along most of the exposed brick wall. His master's voice it was, with the dog looking down the trumpet of the gramophone. I was proud that my parents had chosen that one because I liked dogs. Dad taught us how to handle the shiny vinyl, how to lift it from its flimsy sleeve without touching the disc, hold it by its edges and set it at the top of the metal spike in the centre. Then we snapped the clasp over the top to hold it. It was automatic this stereo, so we only had to flick the lever at the side for the vinyl disc to drop all by itself onto the spinning rubber below. The robotic arm whirred as it rose, pivoted and swung out over the rotating record before lowering ever so gently onto its circling edge. And we waited through the lumps and the hiss and the crackles until finally the music came. It's a beautiful noise going on everywhere Like the clickety-clack of a train on a track It's got rhythm to spare That's when Neil joined our family, record after record of his appeared in the cabinet below the turntable. On Saturday afternoons, after the cars had been washed and the driveway hosed down, I into the house with the beat of the music thudding across the boards under my feet. Dad would be sitting on the maroon velvet couch, head back, eyes closed, a stubby of ear in his hand, just listening. And I'd be enjoying it too, the feel of the music vibrating inside me, and seeing my father relaxed and happy, and knowing why. It's a beautiful noise, and it's sound that I love, and it fits me as well as a hand in a glove. Yes, it does, yes. at night when I was lying in bed, I'd hear the opening bars of Neil's Jonathan Livingston Seagull drifting through the house. And I'd pretend I needed a drink and sneak out to the fridge, passed out on the couch, showered and dressed in his smart clothes, a shirt with a collar and trousers, not jeans, a glass of wine beside him, with his eyes shut, listening to Neil. Lost on a painted sky where the clouds are hung with a poet's eye you may find him if you may find him then cassettes came out and dad bought a player for his car we felt the vump 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 as he drove up the driveway past our bedroom window Sometimes he'd turn off the engine and sit on his own in the car, waiting, listening, until the song had finished. There, on a distant shore, by the wings of dreams, through an open door, you may know him, if you may know him. Then out he'd climb, keys jangling and whistling as he made his way inside. I turned eight and started piano lessons, and as I practised, Dad would slip in and sit in his listening spot on the lounge. I'd play my scales, and when I finished and looked around, he'd be sitting with his head back and eyes closed. He'd open them and say, that sounds really nice, and I'd say, it's only scales, and he'd say, it doesn't matter, I could sit here all night listening to it. And it made me smile and feel warm that I could bring such pleasure to my father. Dad built a holiday home on the coast and late on Friday nights, always late, after he'd knocked off work and whistled while he changed out of his overalls and kept whistling as he showered and dressed and packed the car, we drove to the coast. And Neil would sing, what a beautiful noise, coming up from the park, it's a song of the kids. And it plays until dark. Eventually, my brother and sister and mother would fall asleep, and there'd only be Dad and I awake. And the night sky overhead would be black and vast and filled with stars. 
And Dad would tell me about when his family used to camp along the same coast and fish in the river and his mother would have the fire going on the bank and they'd cook what they caught and how nothing beats the taste of fresh fish like that. And I'd tell him about what I'd learnt at school that week, especially maths and physics because they were the subjects that interested us. And he'd ask me questions about it, like he wanted to learn it too. And he'd look down at me as I sat in the console between the bucket seats of the four-wheel drive and he'd smile and say, wow, you kids know so much these days. Then we might sit in silence for a while until he spotted a star or a planet in the night sky and he'd tell me its name and how it was part of another galaxy. And we'd wonder about the universe and marvel at how big it was and that our minds couldn't comprehend it. And we'd reach the pass and I'd know we were nearly to our shack and part of me wanted us to just keep driving all night so I could stay there talking with my dad with Neil crooning. Lonely looking sky, lonely sky, lonely looking sky. And being lonely makes me wonder why, makes me wonder why. Lonely looking sky. And still Dad came and listened while I practiced piano. Eyes closed, never interrupting, never correcting, never asking for a particular piece or could I play something again just sitting and listening to whatever I was playing. A few years before I gave up, I told him I was sick of learning. He shook his head and looked at me with his brown eyes and wrinkled forehead. Oh no, he said, you can't stop playing. I wish I had the opportunity to learn an instrument. And I couldn't do it to him. So I played on for a couple more years. He did listen to music other than Neil's, and as I grew older, he'd come home from work, his car heaving with music as he drove into the garage below, and he'd bound up the stairs and into my room saying, here, come and listen to this bloke. I'd put down my pen and follow him. Neither of us would say a word as we'd listen, and I'd watch him, wearing his navy blue King G's, rule the poking from a leg pocket, measuring tape bulging from another, eyes shut, concentrating on the music. When it had finished, he'd turn to me and say, what do you reckon? And I'd raise my eyebrows and say, it's good. And I'd love the music because my father did. I left home for university and I'd hear a piece of music and buy the CD. And I'd take it up to Dad next time I visited and play it to him. And at the end I'd say, what do you reckon? And he'd say, yeah. Next time I went home, it had been his collection too. Then I married and at our wedding I looked up from where I sat on the altar and saw Dad in the choir loft in his suit, his tenor voice soaring throughout the church for everyone to hear how good he was. And my chest filled. And later at the reception my brother sang as my husband and I waltzed and everyone threw confetti and streamers over us. Then I took my dad in my arms and we held each other and started dancing. Hello my friend, hello, it's good to need you so, it's good to love you like I do, and to feel this way when I hear you say hello. And I started crying because I was leaving my dad for another man, and I didn't ever want to leave him. Then I had my own family and moved states and I didn't see him as much. And then things happened and I didn't see him at all. And I couldn't listen to me. I think about you every night when I'm here alone and you're there at home. Quite a few years passed until I was able to see him again. And by that stage, he was willing to his dementia. I worried that he wouldn't recognise me. He was sitting on a park bench, thinner and greyer, but as upright as ever. Dad, I said, as I reached him. He looked up. Oh, he said, like he was surprised. Then he grinned and his arms came out and pulled me to him. And I pressed myself into his shoulder, feeling him and smelling him again and sobbing like a child. Hello my friend, hello, 
Just called to let you know I think about you every night. He was different though, shaky on his feet and quieter, folding and unfolding the hanky he carried with him, looking from his plate to his fork as if he didn't know what to do with them, crying a lot, frightened of what was happening to his brain. Not long after that, he came to Western Australia to live with us. And when he went into the hospital, my kids took their instruments and played to him. We sat outside, the kids and me on blankets and Dad in his wheelchair. As they played, he closed his eyes and listened. And when they'd finished, he opened them again and clapped and smiled and looked at me and said, aren't they amazing? Then he moved into the nursing home and I played Neil through the iPod speakers as I sat with him while he lay in his bed, legs writhing under the sheets, trying to sing along. I leaned back and closed my eyes, listening hard, straining to hear something in there, a remnant of that voice that had sang and whistled its way through my childhood. It's a beautiful noise, made of joy and strife, like a symphony played by the passing parade. It's the music of life. Then I opened my eyes again and saw his gummy smile and wiped the glob of pureed pumpkin from his beard. Eventually even the music didn't register, but I kept Neil playing. And when he lay on his side with his mouth open and his breath rattling round in his throat, I stretched alongside him on the sheets and stroked his hair and his hands and ran my fingers all over him and tried to inhale him and crammed every bit of him that I could into my memory. So I'd still be able to smell him and feel him even after he'd gone. Dear Father, we dream, we dream. I lifted myself out and sat on the chair next to him and trimmed his beard and cut his nails one last time and kept Neil playing as I let him go. Sing is a song in search of a voice that is silent.